I uh, come from the Media Lab. Uh, if you don't know the Media Lab, the current director, Joey Ito, calls us the anti-disciplinary. Uh, I think MIT wonders if we have any discipline at all at times. The founder calls us the home of the intellectual misfit, and I think that's probably the most accurate representation as we fall between cracks, we fall between disciplines, and we're going after problems uh, that are usually um, pretty complex. So. I'm going after food. Uh, we've heard a lot about the problems in food. I actually think it's like a dizzying array of problems. And you try to solve one of them, and then you realize it's a symptom of another one. And so I tried to create a derivative for my work. How old do you think the average apple is in a grocery store in the United States, from the date it was picked till the date it got in your mouth? Months, five months, pretty good guess. Five years. Wow. <laughs> they would love that. Uh, so. It's 14 months, which is that, you know, a little toddler apple running around. And you wonder you know, how that happens, and I'll explain it some other time. But the point is, it's lost 90% of its antioxidants by the time it gets in your mouth. It's basically a little ball of sugar and cellulose fiber. So how did we get to a point where an apple a day potentially creates diabetes? The system is very big, very integrated. That feeds a lot of people, but it's going to start to decentralize. The next one, probably the bane of the former USDA uh, head that he showed me this slide. It's what Americans was a supporter opposed in a government policy related to food. These are a lot of things we argue about, but if you go down the list, one of them says mandatory labels on food containing DNA. <laughs> Thank God there's laughter. Okay, everything that was once alive contains DNA, so 80% of the population would support mandatory labeling of food containing DNA. This means they have no idea what food is. And so the next thing we need to solve for is education. So what if in the next 30 years, these slides actually got me a lab at MIT, which is shocking. So I want to create climate democracy. And what I mean is this is a map of the most beneficial climates in agriculture in blue, the least in red. We are slave to climate. Californian farmers are now Mexican farmers. China's the largest landholder in Brazil. Can we start exporting climate? Can we start using climate as a catalog instead of inheriting a climate that we try to dominate? And I'll tell you what I'm doing for that. The next one, always super serious. If you remember this from the best Willy Wonka, when they shot the candy bar, it went through the air and goes on the other side. In a world that is incredibly dictated and described by data now, more so than ever, can we not use those same technologies of big data to ship data instead of shipping food? Which I'll show you in my work. And the last one. I'm the son of an agricultural family. I represent the total typical. <laughs> I, don't do, I didn't do agriculture. My, my family said, don't do food, do something else, do technology. Young people in the United States, uh, the average age of a farmer is 60. In, in Africa, we talk a lot about small shareholder rural farmers, and that's really important. But the big thing we're missing, half the population under 18. 80% of them don't want to be farmers. They're moving to African megacities. They're looking for different opportunities in life. So engaging the next generation farmer, heck, creating the next generation, should be a massive priority. So people need tools to get engaged. So we started developing things. Uh, we call this the food server. Uh, those are my, my nerd farmers and me hanging out in there. If you know about the genome or genetics, I'm talking about the phenome, or the phenomena that surrounds genetics. When you say the tomato from Tuscany on the north slope with the cow next door, it tastes so good you can't get it anywhere else. Kind of, it's the environmental pressure that causes the genetics to express some chemicals that you happen to enjoy. So in here, we design climate. And that climate codes flavor and codes nutrition. So we started doing this, and, and we, we realized that we needed to get more of them built, not, not bigger ones necessarily, but, but more instances of climate. We also do a lot on irrigation. So this system we derived from a NASA Mir space station a long time ago, where they invented this process where they misted water onto roots instead of using soil or using media. The, the important part about this is, is potential for 90% water savings. Those broccoli grew five times faster than you can in field. Um, and so we've done trials in broccoli, trials in strawberries. If you eat a tomato in the United States, you're going to have one of four cultivars. There are tens of thousands of cultivars of tomatoes. These tomatoes I got from an ancient and rare seed bank hadn't been grown commercially in 150 years. There is an entire genetic diversity, a catalog that has never been tapped for its nutrition or flavor properties. We've tapped our genetics for shipping, for resilience of pests, and for drought tolerance. So we have a whole genetic diversity to explore. 
So we created something we call the personal food computer. Think of it like a hacker kit uh, where you could get into climate hacking with food. It runs on Raspberry Pi and Arduino. It's coded in a language that a sixth grader now knows called Python. Uh, and it creates climates inside a box. We put them out in schools. We gave them a video game. We said, OK, there's your digital environment. There's your sensors. There's your actuators. Load a recipe that some other kid in the world has grown, uh, and, and the climate begins. Plant the seed, and it's reanimate of the last time that someone grew with that recipe. But then kids get curious, and they're like, well, what, oh, CO2's bad, right? Like, kills people, so no CO2, crank it down, the plant dies. The kid learns lesson, but then they download the data. And the data becomes a derivative recipe. That kid has now started with us mapping the phenome of that plant. We also code things in Scratch. If you like Scratch, this is our climate creator. I thought it would be for kids. Uh, turns out it's for adults just as much as kids. But you go in, you create any climate that you want, you upload it, you share it with your friends, and you don't, know how, you don't have to know how to code in the command line, which is helpful. We put this out in schools. Uh, this school used farmer's almanac data from 1950 to create the climate of the past, used current climate weather data to create the climate of the present, and projected the climate of the future. Think about teaching a kid about climate change when they have a climate in their classroom. We put this out at the White House a few months ago, and now it's gone kind of virally around the world. I got to speed up a lot. I always do this. PhD flavor chemists, PhD roboticists, geneticists, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, um, algorithms experts, data scientists, architects, uh, working together on this. We just launched this new lab together with folks like Target and Ferrero Rocher. Yes, we are growing hazelnut trees, super crazy, um, to scale up our work and scale it uh, out to the world. So now data. I'm going to go really fast. This is going to be fun. Ambient environmental, environmental data that we collect, this bo box can be built also by a sixth grader. It's fully open source. So we're collecting what the ambient is. We're collecting what's in the water. When people say terroir, we do spectrophotometry to know exactly what minerals are in the water at the time of the grow and what the plant takes. We culture and sequence the root microbiome and also the plant's microbiome. This is fully white space in science. We are now describing for the first time that it takes much more in the root base than, than ever known before to create a good plant. We do non-invasive computer uh, vision so that eventually we can get out of lab testing and we can just use cheap cameras. This is with a $20 webcam. We do gas chromatography, so we take the plant forward, we analyze it chemically to say these are actually flavor volatiles. Okay, so if you're looking at that and you're thinking, I don't want to eat a plant with hexanol, you actually do, it tastes pretty good. And so this is how we find out what's in the plant and what caused it. That's about three and a half million data points per plant per grow. We send that into what we call our robots. This is uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithm that looks through all of the variables of what did you do to the plant and all of the variables of what did you get to the plant, and it optimizes for a target. In this case, we optimized for biomass. So that red area told us, hey, look over here. That means that all that other area we didn't have to do as research, which is the slowest part of agricultural research when you have to grow all the time. And so we've taken these models forward. We sent 30 years of historic weather data into our models from the EPW. Our models told us that, that this little map would be where the best yield of cotton would have been. And then we cross-referenced it against FAO historic yield data, and we were 75% accurate on our first try. If you don't totally grasp what that means, it means that we have a very serious future case where we can use models to predict exactly what chemical compositions, what nutrition profiles, and what yields are produced out in the real world. A lot of companies working on describing fields these days in a number of different ways. This is a whole other data set that says, what would that plant do in that field? What would those specific genetics give us? And what nutrition uh, would come with that? We do collaborate with NASA on their advanced plant habitats. They are doing this work right now in space station and, of course, thinking about Mars. But it's not just Mars. This is Japan, a million heads of lettuce. Uh, every week, 365 days a year, and it sells branded Toshiba. Shocking. Uh, but this may seem foreign to you, but not to a country that has severe concerns about contamination in their food. This sells for three times the price because it is food with provenance. It is food with proven nutritional value. 
It's not just lettuce. You've heard from Uma earlier about the cellular agriculture revolution. This was in Munich, producing prawn 365 days a year. This is a special facility that you may never think of, but this is producing Ebola vaccine. So tobacco plant, tobacco mosaic virus inside of a very specific environment creating vaccines. So it's everything from pharmaceuticals, nutraceuticals, cosmetics, down to lettuce. But this is the case. They're all going bankrupt. And the reason they're going bankrupt is they don't share anything. They think everything's special. They try to sell you on their intellectual property. Stupid investors give them money. And it's like before Ford, when they had cars that were pedal powered, like cars with sails attached, cars that were dangerous that could kill people. We need a giant step change in this area of work. And I'm taking cues from these guys. You, saw, you heard from Kimball earlier, his big brother open sourced the patents of Tesla. Why? Be not because he doesn't like money. Because he needed charging stations and road infrastructure for his cars. Apple, the most proprietary company of all time, of all time open sources its app developer language because it can't possibly keep up without having a giant community. Facebook, open sources their AI, Torchnet, arguably one of their most valuable assets going forward. Why? Because they need the community to help develop it, to help implement it, and of course, human genome, we all know what that's done for basic science. I'll close with this, and time is up, so I'll look for the hook soon. I've open sourced all of this for that exact reason. We're doing something where we take all of our work, the hardware, the data, the software, we put it in a 501c3. It's accessible now and into the future for anybody, and you can commercialize off of it or do research with us. We put it out on Wikipedia, all of our build materials, all of our manuals. We have a huge online forum you can go to. If you just take a picture of this stuff or tweet at Caleb Grows Food, you can find out more information. There's actually people here that are building our machines. Every time I land somewhere lately, there's somebody that comes up to me at the airport and is like, I'm a nerd farmer. We hold build your own food computer clubs. Uh, so if you remember uh, uh, homebrew computer clubs, this is the same weird people in their basements, in their closets, in their classrooms, doing things that no one understands and it's gonna be important. I get these videos sent to me and I don't even know these people. They, they just downloaded all of our stuff, started building it. When they come online, that's a new source of data. That's a citizen contributing to basic scientific research. We've deployed in the world, with the World Food Program in Amman uh, in a Syrian refugee camp. We did not tell them what to grow. Turns out they wanted to grow things from home. It became a cultural object for them. They missed the flavor of the place that they were from, and that creates their culture and creates happiness for them. Close with this slide, I promise. So in the last year and a half, without paying anybody anything, we've expanded our technology to 41 countries to 1,000 contributors at our base. These are hackers, makers, students, scientists, teachers, whoever that lacked before a tool for engagement with such a multi-headed problem and now feel empowered to do something about it. The future of food is not arguing about what's wrong with this. We've done that for 20 years. It's a tired old thing. It's not about camping off GMO, anti-GMO, organic, synthetic, whatever it is that, that draws us farther apart. It's about creating tools that are shared on a network with the next one billion farmers of all different kinds to simply ask and answer their own question of what if. Thank you.